Oops, I had a stream. Hello, everyone. I want to say everyone, but uh, it's actually kind of embarrassing to say that I'm the only one here, as it is every single week. But, you know, things pick up, you know, here and there just a little bit. Now, that's why I put the live. You know, the first time I did, I think the first time I did this live stream with an actual intro of sorts, um, I did it. Hey, wait, is that over there? You didn't see me. All right. I did it that way thinking, you know, if I put, you know, about a seven minute intro or so like that, it'll mean that people who watch me, all three to 15 of you at basically in that average, all of you guys would be able to be like, okay, we'll, we'll, uh, we know that Nathan's coming soon. We'll get a drink. We'll sit down and, or, or we'll turn it on in the background and we'll just listen to him. Uh, it turns out, the first time I did that with the intro, people who watched the video later on, I can't remember what it was about, something Fuji film probably, they were like, dude, the intro was crazy long. It's like, it's a, it's a live stream. And then I realized that maybe the live streams for sort of photography people uh, is a little bit different than people on the like alt-right or something like that, or, or other intros like news shows or whatever, where they might have like a really long sort of like slow roll in where you're like, okay, so something's going to come in, but we don't have to worry about missing anything for the next couple of minutes because this is like just how things are done. Well, it turns out that may have not been the best idea, but ah, we got a person in here. I'm waiting for the person to say, Nathan, we can hear you. Or to, to type it, sorry, got to say type it. Um, anyway, the point is this. Maybe, maybe I got to find a better way to sort of intro this thing. Uh, tried jokes before, didn't work. Maybe it did work. I don't know. No one laughed. I didn't hear any laughter. Not that not that that's sort of something I should be really be aiming here for. But uh, anyway, today, ladies and gents, I got my cheat sheet. A couple things I want to talk about. The main thing that is on my brain happens to be something that's a little bit topical, and we'll get there. And it is my wife's photography. I mentioned it earlier on some couple of weeks ago. Uh, basically, uh, Let's see. I got to make sure. Actually, just one, guys, or guy. Um, I'm just going to go straight to my YouTube channel here. I just want to see that the chat, the the titles all changed because I high time preference photography. Sweet, everything is kosher. Oh, also topical, by the way. Anyway, uh, everyone has a lot on their plate right now. Some people are thinking about you know who's going to be the next in the you know. Uh, some people are thinking uh, about their futures, all that, you know. But uh, today, today we're not going to think that far ahead because the topic on our lips at this moment actually is, I'm audible, okay, thank you, Corling99, is, of course, high time preference photography. So we're going to live in the moment, and that is basically what that means. High time preference, uh, a person whose high time, high, time, high time preference is, you know what? Let's go to Wikipedia. I think it's a good idea. Um, let's see here. Hi, Hi. time preference. And we're just going to share our window here. Let's see but this this here. How do you do it? No, no, wrong. Stop. Share screen. Chrome tab. High time preference. Google. Interesting. Time preference. All right. This is Wikipedia in economics, time preference, or time discounting, time... Delay discounting, temporal discounting, long-term orientation is the current relative valuation placed on receiving a good and earlier date compared to receiving at a later date. There's no absolute distinction that separates high and low time preference, only comparisons with other with others, either individually or in aggregate. Someone with a high time preference is focused substantially on their well-being in the present and the immediate future relative to the average person, while someone with low time preference places more emphasis emphasis then average on well-being in the further future. Why is that the topic for today, ladies and gents? The reason, where am I? Where am I? There we are. The reason, the reason for that is because, uh, well, one thing I discovered when my wife and I were touring Sweden, um, roundabouts where I was born, is uh, that I discovered that she and I photographed in a very different manner. Basically. The way I have always found out that I photographed is that I would have a topic. I'd be like, okay, today or next week, I'm going to go out on this thing and I'm going to make sure to hit these five or six targets along a bullet list of things I want to do. 
and uh, then I'll do it. And I will try not to focus on things outside of that topic. I'll plan ahead. I'll do it. I'll come back with uh, essentially what I can say after doing this for some years is bad photo photographs. Now, if it's something I'm paid for, like say doing a family photograph thing or a wedding or something like that, and I haven't done a lot of weddings and I haven't done any weddings, sorry, since 2013. But when I was doing them, of course, you have to plan ahead. You got to make sure you got your backup. Actually, I was the backup. Got to make sure you got someone who's going to... Was that the backup? We had like four photographers because we were part of a, a studio that was hired by the hotels. So was that a backup? Hmm. I didn't have an autofocus lens. So my guess is that they didn't rely on me. But evidently, they used a lot of my photographs. So maybe I wasn't... I was like, uh, yeah, let's call me a backup. So you got to make sure first that you're you're attached to a studio or that some proper photographer uh, knows you and wants to use you and trusts you. So uh, on my end, I can't exactly say that wedding photography was a big high time preference thing because I just worked at the studio and just had to make sure my batteries were charged and all that. But basically, uh, my photography in general, the stuff that I've been paid for, of course, is stuff that is months planned ahead of time. So that would be advertising stuff. Uh, and if it's like, if it's going to be a sports thing, weeks, months, possibly years ahead of time, it's all planned. And what I come out with is I come out with a more sterile sort of looking photo. Now, the big problem is that you got to decide, are you doing this on a personal level or are you doing this sort of professionally? If it's professionally, high time preference is going to sink you. As it sing basically singly does for every society that in aggregate is time high time preference if you have a, a like a small group of people or a large group of people living in an area with other groups of people and the other groups of people are low time preference they're going to just they're going to make better buildings they're going to be able to have an economy they're going to be able to have education the people with high time preference are going to be the opposite they're going to live in the moment now in photography what i found out from my wife, who, by the way, she has a PhD, so she had to plan ahead. She, in life, is low time preference. But in photography, she just basically was like, oh, we're, we're going out to, like, Insadon or something like that in Korea. And um, I'm like, oh, okay, what's that like? And she's like, oh, it's like they sell a whole bunch of, like, foods and stuff like that. And uh, should I bring a camera? I was like, yeah, yes. And that we'd both go and I'd be like, man, I've got to get this angle and this angle. She would just go and she'd just kind of like fire around and come away. I think after looking back all of her photographs over the years, she'd come away with much better photographs. Now, before I get into her photographs and all that, do you have a cheat sheet? Let me check my cheat sheet. Sorry, I keep doing these mouth sounds. Sorry about that. I want to I want to update a couple of things. So I was in uh, Nagoya. When was that? Friday. We left Friday. And we arrived Friday night. Shinkansen's fast, man. Boom. Arrived there, went to a pool in Legoland. It's like a pool, tiny. It was just having a half hour there. And uh, you just, there's like Lego float blocks and you just put them together. I made my daughter a s awesome castle that was, she was in and she was floating around. And then she's like, make it bigger. And I made it bigger. Uh, I made it, I made it massive. It still floated, but then it had a cap on the top. And it was really structurally pretty sound and it, it freaked her out. So I had to break that apart. We had half an hour there. The next day we went to uh, Lego and then we went to see her grandparents and it was amazing. And I did, I did come away with, I think, some good photographs. And that is because after watching my wife in action for some years, I have picked up some of her habits, which essentially are dropping my habits of planning and just sort of trying to feel in the moment. I'm not going to touch my photographs today. We'll do that another time. But whilst we were coming back, we, we were in Akihabara, I finally got the chance to test back to back a couple of cameras that I've been itching to try. Now, last week I showed, I think it was last week. It was probably last week. I showed the X-T3 with the new firmware and how I... I I haven't done the video properly, but I, I did I did try to explain that the new firmware really speeds things up, especially in low light. And that there's it seems to be just more responsive and good light as well. Um, and the new tracking functions are great. I did mention that. Um, but I basically that is my 
long time sort of experience with that sort of new firmware or with Fujifilm's latest cameras, all updated with their best lenses. And, you know, I'm very impressed as per what Fujifilm can do. And I think that firmware, as long as it's not in low light, basically that, that basically takes X-T3 possibly, I haven't tested in a whole variety of situations, possibly ahead of the Canon 5D Mark IV for um, things like slow moving tracking, some complicated stuff like uh, face tracking whilst moving. That's, I mean, the, the 5D Mark IV, um, if you're using the OVF, is just definitely not as good as the Fujifilm for that. If you're using the, uh, what is it called, the back screen, the LCD, Live View, it's, it's still better. Um, but, you know, Fujifilm would come a long way. But I got to test the X-T4 with IBIS, you know, uh, with uh, the 16 to 55 and what else? Oh, I got I tried the 200 f2 at Yorobashi. Wow, <laughs> that lens focuses pretty fast. It's a pretty impressive lens. Anyway, I got to try both of those lenses um, with the XT4, brand new firmware, all that. Um, and then I got to try the Canon R5 and R6 for the first time. And uh, let me tell you, back to back, just a couple impressions while we're just kind of getting this going here is. Uh, I was extremely impressed. Um, the the X-T4, just a slight amount of thickness that it has to the body just makes it feel a lot better in the hands. And it just, you know, it seems, you know, re roughly as responsive as the X-T3. But when I put on the 16 to 55 and I did the, my test is always like this. For autofocus, it's always the same. I basically, I can't go too far because I get headphones on, but I basically go, I find an object that I can focus on. In this turn, in this instance, it was my daughter's face. So I probably can't publish those photos too much. It'd be too much of a little cuteness for too much for her and too much for everyone. But uh, I basically found her face or I found another object and I would just have the camera, have the lens, usually zoomed all the way out. Why? Because it's harder to track something when you're, when you're like zoomed way out anyway and rock back forward and rock back in about this speed and just hold down the trigger i just hold down the trigger so 12 frames a second with the xt uh four or is it 15 anyway something insane uh i think anything over 10 is basically insane whatever it was it's something insane and you know what it did the shutter's nice definitely nice on the xt3 it did really well it did really well um I bumped up the ISO to 3,200 make sure the frame rate was like 1,000 or something like that. So you'd basically stop motion. Uh, and I found it was it was very impressive. And I was like, wow, this is this is more responsive in this sort of situation than my 5D Mark IV. And it's something I've noticed, again, since I put the new firmware on, that the X-T3 is more responsive for that sort of situation than the 5D Mark IV, which I've been shooting all weekend. Uh, and, then, and then I went over to... And I was impressed. I was definitely impressed. And then I went over to the Canon R6. I asked the lady if I could borrow the little adapter with the, what do you call that? Like the aperture ring or whatever. And I put on my 50 1.2, the one for the EF version. And uh, yeah, it basically focused the same speed as it does on the 5D Mark IV. Um, but it was, it was more tenacious the way it locked onto things. But you know that's not a super speedy lens. But I tried the same thing, and I would I was guessing probably fifty percent, forty to fifty percent shots in focus. And then I tried um, the native twenty four mark twenty four to seventy f two, as well as a twenty four to one hundred five, like the one that goes down to like seven seven point one, and that was kind of ridiculous because I was shooting at seven point one. So it's basically everything's in focus all the time. But when I went to the twenty four to seventy f two. It was, uh, like how do you say it was an eye-opener? Um, the X-T4 is definitely responsive, was definitely ahead of the 5D Mark IV, basically back-to-back -back, um, for that sort of situation. But the R6 <laughs> and the R5, man, I, I don't know where it came from, but man, those things, I've, I've been using the X-T3 for over a year. I used the X-H1 before that x T1 before that, X Pro 1 before that, had an X100S. So when I think mirrorless, basically my brain is going straight to Fujifilm's latest offerings. I've had them when they're recent, all those cameras. And of course, I have used the A7 III when it came out. And the 
from Sony. And that one was the first one to be like, whoa, this thing is this thing could keep up with the, with the DSLR for sure. But going back to the X-T3, which I think is behind the A7 III by some margin, uh, that thing is now in my brain as sort of the default for mirrorless. And even with the new firmware, well, it seems more responsive, and I, I'm like, it, it edges out, edges out the 5D4 in a number of areas. Bam! Uh, even then, uh, I'm like, how do I say it? That being my default, when I picked up the R6 and then the R5, and did the same thing, and they were so much more responsive, and that autofocus, it it stuck on one thing, it didn't get lost very often, and it was just instant. Focus was instant from bam, 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 like. Faster than the 5D4, even with the, the top USM lenses by a smidgen, perhaps, on far focus, close focus. But it was just so much re more responsive than the X-T4. Like, to the effect that I'm like, it's not even the same genre. So, Fujifilm, when it comes to X-H1, you got to pick, or X-H2, you got to pick that up because uh, X-T4 is really next to R6 is behind. Anyway. That's a preamble to say that I finally got to touch the R6 on R5 back to back. Um, and in that sort of racking thing, I was getting about 60% accuracy, maybe 70% accuracy, which is about as high as I've ever used on any camera at that sort of lighting settings in a shop uh, when I didn't have, when I wasn't comfortable with the camera itself. So very impressive. Uh, and the X-T4 was, was less, but it was good. It was good. Anyway, um, mirrorless is definitely picking up. But, that's not what we're talking about today. Today, ladies and gents, I want to talk. I want to get back to that high t high time preference thing. Oh, no, no, did it wrong. I always do this wrong. Here, I'm gonna go over here. Go to my notes. All right. So, when you live in the moment, and this is kind of like how I would describe my wife's photography. Now, we have done some. Uh, work together where we've done some couple couple shots before, um, but we've never actually worked together. But again, whilst we're just sh shooting around, like going around Sweden or whatever, I've just noticed that she has a way of interacting and whatever kind of flits into her brain and inspires her in the moment she just takes. And I asked her right before the stream, obviously she's not going to come on. You know, I'm going to turn on the air con. It's got a sunburn today, so I'm kind of hot. By the way, uh, speaking of high time preference, I've been working on a thing for her for forever. I got like an hour a day to do it. Um, it's made out of wood. Uh, what else? What, what else? Can, I don't want to give it away in case she's, there's no way she's watching, but you never know. Um, but I have like, I've done the plans, but I've had to change things in the in the process. And I'm, I've always used wood tools that are powered and I'm just doing hand tools, except for a drill right now. So, you know, kind of cheating here and there. But uh I'll be done with it tomorrow. It's going to be awesome. And then uh, maybe we'll show it off like the next couple of weeks. Freaking awesome. We'll show you. We'll show you. Anyway. 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 Basically, my wife sees things. I was trying to explain that I do things via plans. And so this is supposed to be uh, whatever, whatever. Uh, she sees something as inspired by it. And then she just she just does it. She just uses it. She just shoots it, whatever. And she finds angles that I never would have thought to use. And I will blame part of this on her being a woman. I think women in general and men in general have different ways of looking at the world. Men are a little bit more technical oriented. We're, we're more attracted to the machine. We're the gas guys in various ways. We're the gas guys. And women are more maybe, I, I don't know if it's, thematic or emotional or whatever it is, but they can capture onto something. And the way my wife captured onto to basically anything was she looked, she just took interesting angles, but she looked at things in a completely different way than I did. So we're just going to, let's share, um, stop screen. We're going to share my Lightroom here. Application window, Lightroom. All right. See if we can do this. All right. Good. I think this is it. So the camera that she has used, or she used to use, she doesn't have a camera anymore, so silly me. The camera that, uh, oh, let's let's make that bigger. That's what she said. Uh, no, is that how I do it? Tab? That's not how I do it. Tab? Oh, how do you do this? Whoa, 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 that's too much. All right. 
All right, I don't know what I'm doing, but uh, let's just say we're doing this here. Okay, so this is in Sweden. Uh, the camera that we took, I took a D200 and she took a D5000, both Nikon cameras. Um, she has one lens or had one lens. It's a 35 1.8 uh, DX that came out, I think, roughly at the same time as their DX line was starting to get popular. And I basically just took, uh, I took a 105, a 180, a 28, and probably a 50. Too many lenses. I basically just use a 28, 2.8 all the time. Um, and uh, so she's got one lens and she's always just thinking out of that lens and like, all right, you've seen this scenery before if you've watched my live streams or, or seen my, uh, uh, yeah, the stream on the 105. It's a scene just outside of between Vietlanda, which is a, a, a small city in southern Sweden and uh, the Bible school I was basically born in. Um, and uh, yeah, like, great. It's a beautiful scene it's, itself, but the way she, how does she frame it? She takes dark trees that are on the right hand side here where the mouse is going down. And then she frames it with a, a bridge here. You don't see the entire bridge, but you have a tree going all the way through the top here, all the way through the top here. It's basically cornered on both sides. And then the shadows are drawing to the center and there's a, a, a river going through it. And then you can say that the sky is a river itself going through the top. And there's a good balance here, but it's a sort of random elements is what I would say, but it's random elements that frame things really well. So she put this little horse way down here. By the way, it's a 12 megapixel camera, so you can zoom in pretty far, but not too far. You can print up an image like this, high resolution, uh, very, well, pretty far, actually. She took this at f2.5, not sure why. Not sure she knows why. Um, we've talked about actually joining forces and doing family photography together. And she's like, I'm not sure I would know how to do it. And I say, you've got the eye. All you got to do is point stuff there. If you need someone to tell you how to use flash or whatever, I'll do it. But yeah, so my image was taken with a 105, so it was much closer. Basically, that just this area here with the horse and hers was just this much wider thing. And I think it came away really showing the landscape as well as the sun, as well as the creatures there. And it's a really beautiful thing. Anyway, oh, uh, what's this? Ah, oh, Virtus, it's good to see you again. Good morning. All right. Uh, we're just looking over some photographs from Sweden that my wife took. Uh, the theme, again, for anyone that's new, is basically high time preference, which is basically what my wife is when it comes to photography. I'm a, I'm a planner, and she is a, a shooter in the, instance, in the instant, and she just sort of goes with the flow. And in general, it doesn't always work in her favor, but when it does, it works in her favor way more than it works in my favor. So next photograph, we're taking um, just just a couple um, who were working uh, near where we were, and they they're married now, got like three kids, but uh, yeah, she I took a different angle and she took this one with this beautiful black backlight, which was basically overpowering the scene. We didn't have a reflector. I actually don't know how it's so well lit, but uh, yeah. She chose the one with the backlight, and I never thought of doing that really, except for as a joke. This is 2011, and I think I was just getting into DSLR photography, and I was thinking, you got to make sure you got everything lit. Da, 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 da. You don't want to have the colors washed out, whatever. And she's just like, I think I, this is kind of a nice angle. And it is. It's so much better. And it's a type of photography that today is popular. Maybe back in 2011, it would be the type of person that would take this would be a little bit more rare. But today, if you look like at any of these sort of like lifestyle photographers or any of these... Um, like model photographers or even, and I think a lot of males have basically picked up this style as well for wedding photography as well. Basically, she just nailed it. 2011, she's just, she just like, she just takes photographs the way she wants. Just ni nicely lit, good separation of the background, but obviously focusing in on these two. Yeah, sure, cut off the fingers here. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's got the interaction here. It's natural. She, she just does it. All right. Same couple, okay, totally overblown here in the highlights, totally overblown here, but I don't think that really matters. They liked it. Why it doesn't matter um, from one perspective, I mean, you're never gonna get that back. There's a nick and let, let me see if I can, let's see if we can draw this back, highlights down. Nah, see, you're basically not gonna get any of that detail from her face back um, or, or whatever, but the feel of it, where she's basically saying to you, the love, I guess, my guess is this is how I feel. Is this is I'm translating what she had in her brain. She's like, see that beautiful look straight from 
I don't remember her name to him. <laughs> I don't remember his name either. Actually, do I? He's Austrian. Anyway, just the love just sort of like radiates, go in a straight direction, and it's basically going off the screen. It's following the sort of way the house is shaped, etc. You can see uh, some of the poor joinery of this thing here, which uh, some okay joinery right here, and then some really bad joinery, by the way. Um, but it's, I don't know, good blend of the trees, good blend of the, <laughs> the bad joinery here, and a beautiful angle on these two. Uh, she just... She just took it. She's not a photographer. She didn't consider herself, consider herself a photographer. She's just like, just pick up a camera and I shoot. And bam, it's good stuff. All right, see here. Next, these two, same one again. She's, I, you know, I don't even know if she thought about the lighting. She just like took it, framed it. Looks really good. Um, and by the way, my, I took the same photograph. It didn't look nearly as good. I was like, I got to make sure it's a, a silhouette. And I did, you know, silhouette looks good, but. Yeah, hers is just so much more natural. Whatever. Next, I think we're here in a city called Ekre, which is uh, just a little bit north of Vietlanda. Um, I think it's actually one of these like famous cities in in uh, Scandinavia. And I would never have thought. Listen, maybe a simple guy. This is 2011. You know, we didn't have all these YouTuber guys, and we didn't have you know, we didn't have all this like m amazing input for all this like all these amazing photographers then any was on anyone that was on youtube doing photography was doing just gear stuff um even fro back then i think was just doing gear stuff and out of out of like a really terrible apartment or something like that and uh, you know in her brain she's like i just kind of want to blur the background and show these leaves and you know again right now it's probably um it's kind of like it's almost like uh, politics where what do they call it the overton window it's always shifting so back like in the 19 Let's say 1900. What was considered left wing and right wing back then wouldn't even be on the chart for right wing today. It would be like that is that is just evil, <laughs> is what everyone would think. And it's like no, that was you know that was that was extreme left wing back then, but uh, today it would be like extreme right wing. Well, for her, basically, in 2011, she's just like you know just take this you know, just bl blur out the background, shows a nice reflection of the house. House is going down here. She again frames with a tree on this side in a bush, and then it's dark on this side. I don't think she thinks about this naturally, but it, it's just a nice natural photograph. These aren't her best ones at the moment. We'll get into some of them a little bit later on. Um, now we're going to go in here to a, a pony. Pony show. Here we are. Uh, oh, I got a, got a comment here from uh, Virtus. Yeah, you love that picture of the lake and the trees. You know, I think that one is actually... Um, wait, Lake, are you thinking of... Let's see here. This one, that's a river, more of a stream, I guess you could say. And then this one here is also um, a very lazy river that's going around the city. The city is actually, um, it's not quite like Stockholm that's on islands where it's like a, what is it called? Vienna, Vienna of the north. Um, but uh, Ekre has a lot of channels going through the city. Um, so this is, you could actually boat yourself through the city. Um, I don't know which one it is, Virtus, but yeah, it's it's it just she just has an eye. The second one, yeah, okay, great, yeah, I, I like that one as well. Um, anyway, like I said, she doesn't consider herself consider herself a photographer. She hasn't taken photographs basically since two thousand since we moved here, um, maybe a little bit earlier than that. And she was only taking them from two thousand nine to two thousand twelve or so, basically. And after that, she hasn't really done much, and uh, she, she doesn't find a lot of joy in it but when she does she just comes away with good stuff and here it's just a pony now half of the half of the thing half of the the greatness about these photographs and i i do think honestly i do think these are great is this is sweden in like late late summer or early fall october 22 sorry october 22 says right here so that would be middle fall not even late fall is that the light in Sweden then, like in southern Sweden even, the, the sun's not going to go that far up. It never goes all the way up. Of course, it doesn't anywhere in the northern hemisphere at that time. But it because you're so far north, the sun is just basically kind of circling around like this before it goes down. Um, and so you never get dark, sort of nasty, harsh shadows anywhere. You basically just get, uh, you just get kind of this fairyland light all the time. So And you can walk through... All the land, respectfully, um, if you have permission, from here to there. And uh, even if you want, you can probably even camp if you get permission as well. So it's 
it's a it's a it's a beautiful way to explore that country, which has a lot to offer um, in a sort of more pastoral way than perhaps Norway um, and even Finland. So now I'm gonna just I don't want oh no no move it move it dude move it okay wait I gotta move the three photographs I want to focus on later I can move that over here okay all right all right here oh wait just a second here I want to also want to just highlight here she's shot f two point five again. 4.5, 1.8, 1.8, 2 2.0, 2.5. She likes 2.5. I'm not sure she does much with the aperture. Here's another one. Um, unfortunately, it's JPEG. I think she edited it in, uh, what is it called? One of those iPad apps a long time ago. So it's actually shrunk a bit. It's not full size anymore, as well as uh, it's JPEG. So the, the original colors, I don't remember. But if you'll notice, she again framed it with trees going this way on both sides going up and then in the center she has two sort of trees almost like guardians basically behind the sort of gate either yeah like i would consider them like uh, these like the two towers or whatever this this part of sweden that we we're walking through and she just sees stuff like that it just comes natural to her i wouldn't probably have thought frame these two trees again it's 2011 no we're not watching youtube there's not these sort of like photography channels it's just gear stuff and we were we weren't watching that stuff anyway she just comes away with what i consider is gentle art just gentle art um and very near to our school just just a cow just a cow but again she did she probably edited this photograph in snapseed i think yeah snapseed is the one i think it is called um now the the fall off here is i believe natural to the lens although i'm not sure this is f 2.5 so it might be um, but she didn't crop it or anything like that. What she has is cow, cow, cow. And then you have open space over here, open space over here and a tree sort of dividing it. So it's kind of, it's almost like one of those, again, I'm going to bring up politics. One of those like political compass tests where it looks like she would be like left libertarian down here. And this is the dividing line here. Um, and then up here you got like Nazi and then you got like here, like the ones that say the left is the real Nazis. And then up here you got like the the other guy's a communist. But anyway, it's, it's just a just the way it's laid out. It's like obviously divided in four sections. She wasn't planning it. Just no way she was planning it. But there it is. <laughs> it's just it's just art. And here we got one of these ones that reminds me of like trailer park. In a good way. Um there's a lot of in the backwards of Sweden, at least in the southern part, where a lot of people live, there are uh there's a lot of sort of rotted buildings that have been around for 100 years 200 years uh some of them being upkept some that have not but she we didn't have a flash or thing she i don't think so did not fire yeah no flash on this thing <laughs> she just took it at, at uh, f2.2 again there's a chicken coming out of a door and i don't know if i don't remember that being a chicken house we're just walking through somebody's farm i guess and uh, this chicken had taken over this little whatever building this was tiny little building and you know there's a banded chair here there's some sort of bucket it's the sort of quintessential countryside, countryside photograph, not the countryside where you're like, oh, there's a log cabin or, or countryside where it's like, oh, the, you know, there's a, there's a beautiful pasture. No, it's the countryside, like the used countryside. And she just, <laughs> it looks, this is actually edgy looking. This is something I wouldn't expect from her, but it's, it's edgy. It's like, it's like, there's a chicken coming out and there might be. And if you're you're like a like a, a super lefty, you'd be like, there's probably like some sort of you know like bad relationships between the family and all this, and probably some some uh, wife beating or whatever. And if you're a righty, you're like, hey, that looks like my my garage or whatever, you know. Anyway, uh, but it's edgy. It's got it's got a lot going on here. There's even like maybe a broom that's down here and kind of broken or whatever. Okay, let's go here. Next photograph was sort of the entry to this. Uh, stream the one i use in the background again she uses kind of a squiggle line tree here almost like black forest sort of scary stuff like snow white stuff and she uses it to divide the top from the bottom in a different way this time where you still have the trees on this side she was not i don't think she was planning this and in the center you have this house now it's not a haunted house i don't think she's not trying for that she's actually focused if i can see this it looks like she's focused on this branch right here or that one right there. So it's it's got this sort of random focus element to it that also brings an eclectic sort of like, what's going on here? Or almost like 
it, it, it was a snapshot, but it's almost like she's got the framing of, of an adult, but sort of the randomness or chaotic element of a child, but it's done in such a, a nice and I consider neat manner that it just, it works. Is it one of her best? No, but it's a, a nice one. Anyway, next one. She, et, no, this is an actual NAF. Um, so what was the, what was the original? Like, let me see here. Ah, it just, just had color here. Um, but yeah, it's just, just dark trees. She's making sure that basically uh, what you see is darkness veining out or sort of lightening out to the from the bottom up to the top, streaming out almost like synapses like that through the sky, which actually is probably an interesting way to think about. It's an interesting way to think about the trees, almost like, because if you're, if you're like sort of a traditional person, you might think of like the trees as sort of like Chesterton did, growing out of the earth as part of the earth and touching the sky and then being one with the sky where the earth and the sky and everything is kind of intertwined. And then you yourself who are standing on the earth are, are then part of the earth, even if you jump and that you, anyway, it's this, this sort of like um, synergy thing. Um, but there's also sort of the way I would look at it is like, because it's got that synapse look to it and the tree is branching off or ram ramifying into a million directions. You have this sense of, the tree understanding the sky because it's got so much surface area because all these fingers or tendrils are going straight into the sky and they're getting a feel for it all over and the sky is then touching a tree in the same way. So anyway, I consider this as a, as a somewhat traditional person, somewhat um, as a more artsy and essay style photograph. Now, now we're going to go back to the city and we're going to get into three photographs that I really want to talk about. Um, but first we have two statue here how she edited it actually she it's not edited um it's not cropped or anything so she just basically takes a little chunk out of the book here crops close to his elbow but basically the, as far as i can tell it looks like there's a hand space icon here between that elbow and this one here roughly and then fine cuts off the knee but she's basically got it like it's like an interrupted scene she doesn't want to have the entire statue that would be my i don't know what she would say would it be too boring <laughs> would it be too would that be what everyone wants or was she was she did she see a story behind this obviously the statue is looking off in the corner we're not seeing what the statue is looking at is another building is it just is this is the statue alive in terms of as a figure is it alive or with a story behind it or is it just like one of those ones where it's just it's just a statue but i i think there's a story behind it she or her photograph is basically saying I don't have time to look at your camera at the moment. And she's zooming into it, into this in such a way that it's almost like if the statue was alive, he was maybe having a conversation with the photographer way down there and suddenly something bothered him and he looked over. So kind of there's the story element that I think, I think that's a, a good, a good way to look at it. And finally, she took a, this is 2011. When was this? December 20, so right before Christmas. Uh, this was me 10, roughly 10 years ago, smoking a licorice cigar. Now, how did she take me? This is a portrait here. She put me between, I don't know who, I hope it's a conqueror, wouldn't mind behind that, and some sort of basilica. She put my head, which is, <laughs> as the years go on, looking a little bit more like the basilica with in terms of the hair situation. And I got the same glasses, man. I was, was I a hipster? Am I a hipster? I don't think I'm a hipster. I might be a hipster. I hope I'm not a hipster. I didn't mean to be. I like my licorice. Anyway, it's got me looking off. I would say, you might you might say romantically, I'm looking off in the direction of the, the, the statue, even though I'm not looking at the statue, even though I'm not looking at the statue, but it's in the direction. And so maybe whatever the statue stood for, Maybe I'm seeing that thing, that spirit infect me or inspire me. And behind it or in front of it is the charge, the basilica. Is it a church? <laughs> is it a museum? It's something cultural. Maybe that's me realizing, realizing a couple of things here. Now, before we get any farther, guys, I want to show you three photographs that have highly impacted me. I... Back when we lived in Korea, I, 
for a little while, I was quite inspired by uh, street photographers. And there, there are some very good ones. I have a friend, um, there's no way he's watching this, um, on Instagram. What's his name? <sighs> Let me find his name. You got to check him out. He's really good. Let's see here. Instagram, ask for more time. Enter screen password. Don't say the screen password. That show up in my glasses. It might have. <laughs> All right. Um, what's his name? On, on Instagram. Anyway, he's he's really good. Um, he's one of those people that sometimes uses Flash, sometimes doesn't. But he's he's got the street in his blood. What is this? How do I go, I go find people? I'm. How do you do this? I haven't used this bloody thing in so long. Following. Uh, <laughs> this is like a total break here, guys. But um, I'm going to find it here. Chase. No, it's not him. Uh, what's his name? This is real professional. Real. Ah. Sin, Synthesaurus, Synthesaurus. Anyway, he's got the sort of photography, the sort of street style that you here. I'm going to put his. Um, let's see here. What? How do I? How do I find his? Syn, you know what? I'll just do it here. Go to go to Instagram. I'll just type this in here. Go to Instagram and check out at Saurus. His photography. Um, does everything the nostalgia the edgy and the sort of like just typical like sort of uh, so i don't want to say typical but the sort of stuff i would never have the gahonias to do like where he's getting close to someone but he's not like right in the face and getting them mad but like he's he's capturing action on the street which is in in the way where you where you're like wow that you know i've never thought of somebody eating ice cream being interesting but it is because there's like there's this trail he does it with light trails, with flashes, etc. So longer exposures. And so you see action where it doesn't exist. Like he brings out action. Now, my wife doesn't do that. And she's not a street photographer. She would never consider herself that. But when she takes stuff on the street, there's, there's a magic to it. Now, the first one here, this is not a street photograph per se. This would be... A street vista. What does she do here? If it were me, what would I do? Maybe I'd focus on the lamp. I don't know. I'd probably stop it down and try to get as much detail as possible. She shot it. Let's see here. What's the f-stop? 1.8, fully wide open. And she looked and she liked the cobblestones. But she didn't get the angle on the cobblestones where you're like, looking at this is a cobblestone. What she did was focus here on the cobblestone and probably then just recompose. She took this at ISO 800. So... There might even be a slight bit of motion blur because she took this at one thirtieth of a second. Again, I don't think she planned it out in terms of take it at this frame, uh, at this shutter speed, at this aperture, whatever. She's just like, this in my brain is what I'm going to create. Or not create, I'm just going to snap it, whatever she sees. And she just took this photograph and then I've looked through photos. There's not another one of the same sort. She didn't like try to take it a million times and then get the perfect one. She's like, okay, this is the sort of feel that I like. And what did she do? She blurred out. She shot at 1.8. Even if she shot it at, you know, at deeper, she, these still would be blurred out because she's shooting right here or focusing right here. But she, she blurs out all the people on the street. And so what you get here is sort of, you could say it's sort of painterly, impressionistic, where you don't see the details. What you see is... The idea, like, if you sort of squint or if you uh, cross your eyes or something like that, looking at a scene, what you'll see is the colors and the shapes. And what she came away with, again, beautiful framing where the road is curving to the right and the sky road is curving toward the center. But if you follow it, it would curve again to the right. And they're framed on either side, of course, by these walls. You've seen a million photographs like this, but she took it where it's focused here in the front and blurred it out, and the photograph no longer be is a photograph. It's now an impressionist, impressionistic painting. I remember back in school, just regular old school. I wasn't doing like uh, like art school or something like that. And they were talking about like photography killed certain types of painting. And I can't remember if they were if it was like realist realism or whatever. And and the rise of impressionism was because the photograph came in and it could suddenly transfer what is seen by the eye exactly and put it in some sort of printable form because of that 
the sort of art nature of painting changed. And here, I would say that while you don't have the strokes, etc., what you have here is a softening of a subject to the effect where it self becomes a painting. So it's the inversion of photography to painter form. Now, I'm just going to move here. All right. The next photograph I want to take, there's just two more. It's here. This was, I can't remember which station, was it Slifson or something like that, which station it was. She took it from a high angle. We're just overlooking, we're just walking by on a balcony. Um, I saw her stop and take a photograph. And so, of course, I took out my camera, I took a photograph, didn't come out nearly as well. What does she do? She takes a train here on the right with a dark, like there's no detail. I don't think there's any detail here. A little bit of detail here. But it's basically a dark path from the right into the center <laughs> with pipes here. She's standing right over the pipe. That's going up the center. And then on the other side, not exactly, um, what's the word? Perfectly balancing the train, but roughly balancing the train, there's a pipe going up here. So you basically have three lines going up and you have these ones over here, or whatever. But basically three lines going up. And then you have, again, her. she likes her verticals. It's got these vertical columns here stopping that. So it's almost like, okay, stop the movement this way. And then everything sort of moves into the frame. Let's see what what, what frames. She did this again at F1.8. What she focus on? She fo it looks like she, f I want to say she probably, I don't know if she meant to focus on the train, but she, yeah, she focused on the train, not on the clock. Interesting. I probably would have focused on something in the front, but she focused on the train and it's in focus enough that now, unlike the last photograph where the photograph turns to a painting, you're seeing, pardon me, you're seeing faces. You might even be seeing a kiss, um, seeing a smoke. You're seeing, yeah. It's also Sweden that doesn't really exist at the moment, thanks to a lot of uh, importing of different peoples. Um, of course, Sweden has changed drastically in the last 30, 40 years. Um, but yeah, then she has the, the clocks, almost like the the threads to needle, like needle eyes going up. So you could almost put like a thread going up there. And, you know, they were there. It's not like she in her photograph made the scenery change itself. But I've seen photographs from the station. I haven't seen the same one. She took it in such a way. Somehow there's also darkening on the top here. I don't know if it was from a lighting thing. I don't know. It could have even been 320 second. It could be that the lighting itself clipped a bit. You know, when you get the, the, the phases, could be something like that. But anyway, it's, yeah, it's, it doesn't really look like it's from, I don't think it looks like it's from necessarily this century, except for, you know, the, the styles of, of people's clothes, which are, you know, really casual and bad generally. But uh, yeah, it's just, really well oriented again we have the photograph becoming a painting and then we have the a photograph capturing the moment that then somehow arranges all of its elements even though everything was there when she took it of course the photograph itself is arranging things both in the brain thematically as well as arranging the perspective in a certain order that makes it it's too thematic i would yeah, but here's my favorite photograph that she's ever taken. This was, um, this is just, there's, there's, uh, it's, a, it's an exported TIF. I think it's just from the, the, uh, the NEF file, the raw file. So it's not really, I don't think there's anything done to it. Um, actually, if you, if I would have developed it, it would look quite a bit better, but I don't think that's really important here. We're walking down the street. There's a mess. It's, I can't remember what part of Stockholm this is. I think it was Stockholm, yeah. Oh, um, what part of Stockholm it was. I'll see just a moment. But we're just walking down the street. There's so much to see. There's, um, it, We're near a Christmas market, I think. This is a barbershop. We're walking there. There's a little bit of light. There's posters all over the place. I, I passed it over because <laughs> it was like, there's just too much going on. Now, she's Japanese, so... Japanese people are a little bit more, just don't listen to me, a little more used to chaos and disorder. Th there's orderly parts to Japan, but the modern city is not orderly at all. It's just chaos of 
the buildings are like, why is this building on top of that one crashed onto this one? And there's like this much room between two buildings in between an earthquake. They, they're they beautifully engineered, so they shake back and forth like this. But it's like you open up your window, you just see a building right there that you could reach over. It's just, it's chaotically organized. The roads, instead of curving nicely like this, they go jagged angles. And it's like, it makes it hard to drive. There's not good sidewalks. The infrastructure is, in terms of, the human interacting with the elements is poor. There are certain parts that look organized, but it's just as is not. So I, th and there's signs everywhere. Signs. Even I thought Canada was bad, where there's just sign. They put signs as close to the road as they can. In Japan, it's like they put the sign on top of the sign, on top of the sign, so you know, two kilometers down the way, there's like there, there's gonna be a McDonald's. There's gonna be or the, there's a sign for McDonald's, and underneath there's five other signs for something else. It's just like. If you're adverse to advertising, you, you'd hate modern Japan. And I gotta sell. I gotta tell you, man, modern city life in Japan is just uh, is grating because of this. It's constant advertising. Anyway, I'm. I didn't come from countries like this. So when I saw this, I probably passed over because I, I couldn't even process what's going on in this scene. And uh, she did. <laughs> like, she just snapped. And then if you zoom in, what do you see here? Okay, signs uh, all over the place for something. Some. Uh, Something's going to happen here. Some sort of show, maybe Elvis Costello, uh, foster the people. Who knows whether there's some sort of weird thing, left wing, disgusting this. Um, some sort of, jeez. 14th November, Stockholm debaser meds or medis, whatever. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, po possibly a lot of like degenerate stuff. And then just like some, I don't know whatever, just, just stuff, just like some cultural stuff. And right in the center, surrounding... Let, here, whatever whatever these posters are pointing to, I don't remember. Some sort of events, maybe some, like again, either some degenerate art or some sort of pub or something like that. All this stuff, all this stuff that's pointing to other things that's happening. And it's it, it seems to be all events. And in the center is a very calm scene, but it's lined up perfectly. First, we have four, wait, four, five heads in this scene, but three people. So what we have here is the barber. Looks like he's, what's he doing? Looks like he's, yeah, he's just maybe talking to the kid. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he's he's uh, recharging his batteries. I don't know what he's doing. He's got like that, that, uh, that like, what is it? Perennial sort of Northern European and Southern European, like, uh, what are they called? Cor not courgette. I can't remember what it's called. Around the neck, cravat or whatever. You know, that sort of like, you know, you, you come to North America and you still wear that. And it's like, I am European. That's a great accent. And then next to him, you've got the grandma who's actually sitting down here. Or mom, probably grandma. And she's sleeping. And she's also in the mirror. And under that, you have the little boy. And then you have oh, his reflection, sorry. And then you have his head and then grandma's head. And they're all in a line, one street going down tallest to shortest in a, a, a beautiful sort of arc, but also a line pointing to, I don't know, bicycle pointing down to this sign going down here. The one sign that we cannot read at all um, that's reflecting then some this something Beowulf and, and Lung or something like that. Uh, I got this line that's going down here and it's bisecting everything down at the bottom. But if you come back to this image, the little boy is looking straight at the camera, almost as if my wife was like, okay, guys, we want to take this one scene for a film poster or we, this, I, I want to get this image I've had in my mind finally done. So all of you guys who are hired for this photograph, Let's just do this. Okay, grandma, you're going to go down here and we're, I'm going to make sure I line myself perfectly in front of the mirror, etc. No, we're walking down the street. I don't know if she paused 30 seconds, 20 seconds. She took the photograph. Later on, she checked it evidently. And then she was like, oh, that's interesting. All these people were looking here. But the moment here, she didn't plan it. Walking down the street, her Japanese brain could somehow sort of figure out what's going on in the scene so that she can focus on something where I, I just... It just blurred me all out. And uh, she comes out in a photograph that has the boy, like a movie poster, looking straight in the camera, grandma here and grandma here, sleeping, 
but you would never uh, listen. I wish there were like 400 people watching this. They'd be like, dude, that's amazing. I, I'd like some feedback. Um, I've showed, uh, we have it hanging up in our house. You've seen it in the back of my, um, seen it in the back of my, some of my videos before. And whenever we have someone in our house, they, they always, they, you know, none of them are professionals or whatever, but some of them are into photography that they, they're always like, whoa, where'd you get these prints? You know, it's like, oh, my wife took, them. whoa, you know, but everyone says that when you, when you show off photographs, you take, oh, that's really nice. But this one, the more I look at it, there's, it's not just that there's a story to tell. Uh, let's go back here. It's not just that there's a story to tell. There's so many, like, you could say, like, count the faces in this photograph. Like, there's a partial face here. One, you can count all these degenerate faces here. You can count here, here, there. Like, then all the people in the middle here. You could, and there's a partial face here. Count, count how many doors. Like, count, and then count... Like you could be like, okay, where's the center? What's the focus of this photograph? Is it how do you how do you back out here? All right, there we are. Like, what what's a photo? What's a focus here? What's the what's the theme? Is it is it the is it the salon? Is it the is it the posters? Is it, is it the faces? Like, what what is it? Is it is it the the mix of the sort of serene and and transcendent? I will say, yeah, actually transcendent scene in the middle where someone's getting the haircut. Hair is one of the most transcendent things except for guys that go bald. And even then it's transcendent because it's gay. you started out with no hair. Generally you get hair and it goes back and it's repeated over and over and over. But throughout your hair, your life, you're going to have to cut it. Who knows? hundred times. Maybe some people more than that a thousand times. I have no idea, but it's, you're always, it's, it's part of your body that you always have to take care of. And every single person has to take care of it in some way or another. And Around it, you have all this sort of culture from 2010, degenerate or otherwise. You have you've got the name of this salon that in horrible lettering. You've you've got this cravat. You've got this cheap mountain bike. You've got all this sort of like junk from the modern world interposed with one of the things that people have had to deal with since time immemorial. And you have the people lined up. You could also say. In order of age, maybe. Is he older than her? I don't know. But it goes down, the boy's the youngest, and then it goes back where the grandma's the oldest, the boy here tied. And then, you know, it's there's a million ways you can look at this photograph. I mean, you even have here, there's themes like war here. You got the name of the, the place. Like, it's 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 one of those photographs, I think, personally, that uh, that like places like 4chan or whatever would, would probably really have... A wonderful time sort of picking apart in terms of like what day what day even if you don't show the the uh, exif what day was this and what like what what was like they would be like oh on this street so and so passed by whatever you know anyways uh, just uh in my estimation the most impressive non photograph i've seen taken by a person who's not themselves a street photographer or doesn't consider themselves that. And she just walks down the street. And because when she put gets behind a camera, she is, like I said, high time preference. So all she does is just whatever is interesting or whatever. Maybe even you could say it's almost like a water witch where you, you have this piece of tree. I don't know if it works or not. And it, it's supposed to find you water. Well, maybe for her, she puts up the camera and it just sort of directs her to something. And she just shoots. And it just goes straight in that way. And there's no there's no direction there's no there's no malice or goodness of forethought it's just shoot and she comes away with stuff that yeah i i think rivals anyone out there now i may be wrong i'm not you know um, like for instance i love a lot of uh, Jonas ross stuff um but his his is uh, focused on the nostalgia and then the angles and some of his beautiful angles etc are, are some of the the best ones ever i've ever seen but they're 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 very much thematic and you can definitely tell that he sees the world from a theme first and then he he applies that theme to the world and then comes away looking at the world in such a way that he finds angles that may not exist naturally in 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 other words a person like you or me walking down the street going about a normal eyes would never notice those angles but he does um, but he's looking for stuff um and he sees them in a, in a very special way my wife 
she doesn't have that theme in mind. She just shoots. And uh, yeah. Also, if you want to get gearhead talk here, the D5000 was the first APS-C camera I had used uh, that you were re really able to push things like shadows, highs, etc. here. Let's see if we can just kind of push, do something here. Um, what can we do here? Let's take, let's take this one here. This is a NEF file, so we can probably do something here. Let's see here. Um, see if we can do shadows. Let's go boost the shadows. We'll boost the shadows. This thing's already taken ISO 800. You've seen a little bit of like noise, um, not noise like grain noise, but like sort of pixel noise um, from, I guess, temperature of the sensor, or whatever coming up here. But it it looks good even um, with everything boosted. And it's kind of that, like that low contrast thing that you might see in like a video game or something like that. Um, definitely the image style is definitely changed here. We can go raise the exposure here and the highs, you know, still have some definition here. You see, by the way, a little bit of chromatic aberration here for, for all of you camera guys, like real serious camera guys here. Um, sharpness, by the way, it's good. Definitely noise, but it's a type of noise that would look good printed, except for these, maybe these hot pixels. That's what's called hot, hot pixels. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, you can push that camera. This is this is uh, exposure plus 100, so that would be like 1600. Then you add 100 to the shadows, 100 to the... It was probably like, you know, 3,200, 6,400, but it, you know, roughly, it looks, it looks good. It looks good. Um, anyway, I'm, in terms of gas stuff, that camera totally blew me away. And I was using um, the D, what is it called? The Nikon D200. Now that camera, a whole bunch of things I didn't like about it. One was that the battery was like maybe 500 shots per battery load. And that was, of course, back in the CCD days. CCD, CD, CCD colors are great, but it used way more energy, I guess. Um, and hers, it lasted longer, even though it used, I believe it used a smaller battery, at least. Um, it could take video. It was tiny, made out of plastic. But uh, funnily enough, even with a crappy grip and everything that that camera had, and it was plastic, it did get bounced around more, but didn't show the wear that my Nikon D200 did. Now the D200 is stronger. It was weather sealed. You know, you could probably take it to more dangerous places, etc., and come away with a camera that still takes photographs. The D5000, in terms of what it could do inside, was pretty incredible. Um, but that's the sort of the gas sort of thing. Um, that thing also doesn't matter for her. And I think this this is kind of the same thing with a lot of women. They're especially in the photography business. Business they care about the output. And I think male photographers probably could care about that a little bit more. I remember seeing um, in a recent Fuji Fuji Rumors um, uh, article, they were talking about like representation here and there, and, and the topic got on like, white men have always done this in photographing. It's like, well, you know, if you're talking about the English language, basically, if you're talking about gear and even photography, photography is in general, I, more males are into it. Just, that's just how it is. More males are into it. And uh, when it talks about the gear part of it, it's basically going to be all guys. There will be your token female. She'll be there. That's great. Um, but in Japan, I'm not expecting it to be female gearheads talking about new cameras. And I'm not expecting it to be in Japan, some foreigners like myself talking about it in Japanese, just not going to happen. So the, the 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 thread ended up turning to, to crap, and I stupidly got involved. But um, yeah, women and men are different when it comes to gear, and it looks like, as far as I can tell, are different when it comes to the sort of photographs they take. Where men, I don't know, it's more angular, more mechanical, maybe, and women just I don't know. They get this like there's a soft, th there's this. There's this connection with the person there that, that I don't think men in general can get. And it's uh, the distance is gone. I don't know. I got to say, uh, if we go full time uh, family photography, I want to I want to do her lights because <laughs> uh, she's just got the eye for that. Yeah. Anyway, that's what I gotta say about that. If you got any, we only got two guys here. This was kind of uh, because we're talking about photography, not gear. 
probably no no men watching this except for except for my man Viratus. Viratus. Any questions, by the way? Any questions? If anyone's actually sitting there listening, be great. I'm just gonna finish a wine or start. That is a dirty. I spilled this when I was working on the thing that I can't tell you what it is. I spilled it outside, so there's probably also some dirt on the top here. I haven't washed it off. If you got any questions, please do mention it. Bring it up. Um, I'm going to finish one of these things, and then I'm just going to head out. So, uh, yeah, uh, while 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 you might be thinking about it, I'm just going to go to, let's just go to, like, uh, no, mirrorless rumors, and just put stuff together. Because we got to do our gas stuff here. I honestly think gas is a is a really important thing, um, and I, I love I love I love gas. Gear mirrorless rumors. Let's go here. All right, what do we got here? Ooh, a new DJI. You know, uh, we're we're just in a very beautiful part of Japan called Karuizawa, and it had some beautiful fall colors, and there and also. Nasu, Nasu, no, no, Nikko. There's a road up in this place called Okuniko that is like this. Maybe about 16 switchbacks and then a loop up a mountain. And uh, my my little, what is it? It's got a 686 centimeter engine um, without a turbo. My little car the entire time, just second gear all the way up like that basically barely getting up everyone's passing me even people basically walking um but you get to the top of it and then you think what would this place look like this road on the way like from above and we did see a helicopter shot of that road taken many many years ago and it was beautiful but i thought that would be a, a beautiful road to actually take with a drone and that was the first time i thought about drone photography might be interested to get into again that would be a drone i think probably in general is something that a, a guy is going to be more interested in he's going to be like i want to plan this out i've got this theme going on i want to make sure that you know i've got the right time da, 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 da. you know maybe you miss the magic around you but you've got this 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 image and anyway i drones i think something to look out something to look out for definitely oh yeah yeah all right guys Guys, this one here, this bad boy here, uh, second here, uh, we're going to get to Viriatus. If you guys have, wait, no, that's not it. Where's my, there it is. Sorry about that. If you guys have not seen the reviews of this, I think there's a guy named Gary Wong. Gary Wong's my friend. Uh, some Something else. You'll see it on like Deep, Deep Preview or you'll see it on uh, some other site. It's got a review. Oh, wait, it's probably this. No. Where is it? This might be it. That might be it. This thing is awesome it's a it's an 85 millimeter 1.8 lens 597 bucks let's see here let's go to let's go to deep uh, bh photo here just for a second here can we can we do that you can't see it i don't think you can see it here you can't see it um wait just a moment here um this thing let's check it out i just want to see how light it is just sort of show the specs yet it works on like l we know that 355 grams. Three. Okay. All right. Here, here, here. What we can do here is we're gonna go uh, stop the screen, share a different screen. Check this out, guys or guy. To you here, uh, BH photo right there. Check this out. Okay. Specs: 579 bucks for this lens. The bokeh looks really good on this lens. The reviews seem good. Autofocus is nice. There's no motor noise. This would be comparable again. Okay, full frame supremacy all the way for a, so many different reasons. The bodies are bigger, yes. The lenses sometimes are bigger, but it, if you if you just talk about in like full field of view, depth of focus, those terms only equivalents, then I think lenses are basically the same size between APS-C as well as full frame and maybe even micro four, th four thirds. The physics is going to disc is going to basically tell you what you can do here and there. And I don't know if this lens has weather sealing or not. Um, I don't even want to read about that. But let's just remember this: five hundred ninety bu nine five hundred ninety seven bucks for this thing. Panasonic, of course, it only works on your Panasonic and Leica cameras. 
um, and it is 355 grams, and it is 73.6 by 82 millimeters. Length is 82, 73 wide. Okay, now let's go to Fuji film, Fuji film, 56 millimeters. Uh, here we are. All right, this lens has been out probably what since since around 2013. It's probably I'm guessing it's going to be about the same weight. Let's go down here. Specs. 405. So this one will have the same roughly the same depth of focus and roughly the same or almost exactly the same uh framing. It's heavier. It 73 it looks like it's actually a little bit smaller. So that one was 82 by 73. So it's actually a little bit smaller, but it's a little bit heavier. It's also 400, 400, bucks, 400 bucks more expensive. This is the big reason I'm a full frame supremacist. Now, a lot of these modern lenses that come out for these cameras are just more expensive because I guess it seems like the idea is because they're not they're not compatible with DSLRs anymore, and there's no sort of sort of legacy comparison sort of database. So it's not like I wish this 51.4 rendered like the 51.4 from 1967 that I can use on my Canon or my Nikon. No, 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 that's all gone. So because of that, a lot of the focus for these new lenses is absolute sharpness, low distortion, this low chromatic, blah blah blah. blah. You know, it's basically uh, high end all the way. And because of the lenses are, some of them are massive, as we see with the new Fujifilm 51 or 1.2, 51.2, is it 51.2? 50 F1. Oh, by the way, I tried that out um, in the shop. It's big, um, but it's not, it's definitely big and it's heavy, but it, it wouldn't seem so big and heavy if the body you put it on were something like an X-H1. At the shop, they had just the X-T4 and I think an X-T3, um, Yorobashi, and it was definitely big on them and awkward. And actually, it, it, it dwarfed like the front of the camera. It was weird. It, it was like one of those, you put the camera on the lens sort of thing, but it it didn't feel that big when I'm holding it next to DSLR. It j But it, it was definitely awkward on the X-T4. Um, but it felt good. Focus was all right. Again, for Fujifilm, they've nailed stills. The video quality for the output is incredible, but the focus is still there's jumps and it's it's just not smooth like it is. I would even say Panasonic at this moment with DFD, even with their problems tracking movement, is still graded on a curve smoother than... Fujifilm's video for focus, autofocus. So anyway, but anyway, 999 bucks. It's a little bit heavier, a little bit smaller. Also, this new one from Panasonic. Yeah, it's probably got some sort of um, polycarbonate exterior, etc. But it's a newer one, a newer lens. Look at that beautiful, beautiful focus ring. Look at that. Oh, wait, you can't see it. All right. There's a big focus ring on the Fujifilm one, but it's metal. I don't know what it is on the the new Panasonic one. It might be rubber, it might be plastic, but the Fujifilm one. If you if you guys use the Fujifilm lenses, you know that they don't. The focus doesn't. F Listen, if you've only used Fujifilm and you just got into Fujifilm, and you or maybe you only used autofocus lens before that from like the Nikon D era, and even some of the early A AFS ones, it's not going to feel that bad. But if you ever used manual focus lenses, the Fujifilm ones are often some of the weirdest feeling lenses just disconnect is bad and sometimes when you you change the manual focus you feel the gears grinding the little tiny gears inside and it's just it's just it's off um but anyway i mean this just check okay here hit back look at this wait uh, that's not it <laughs> i can do this i can do this look at that look at that just beautiful it's narrow and long, that's what she said. No, no, it's not. Nice, nice ribbed focus ring. It's not too tightly ribbed so that you, it's slippery. It looks, I don't know. Panasonic are very, very good designers. All right, let's go back to mirrorless rumors. How do we do this? Oh, I think we got a little thing here. You know, it looks like everyone's leaving. So, hey, Virtus, I also see that this more, I also see that this more recent generation cares more about gear and the technical aspect of it than taking pictures itself. 
Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if that's um, true of the past as well, or if that's something that we've all kind of like focused on for a very long time. I got in, really got into photo photography from 2007. Yeah, 2007, when I picked up a D200, it was already a couple of years old. And I was like, this is going to be the camera for the rest of my life. Well, I used it so much it, and dropped it. And it, it basically, it basically I, wore, I wore it out. It, it still worked, but it, I basically wore it out. It didn't look like a D200 anymore when I was done with it. Um, and so I got in. I did take photographs back in the film age, of course, prior very narrowly before digital cameras became a thing. Um, and I used my father's Pentax. I think it was a K1000 or K, was K something, as a lot of people did. But I wasn't into photography necessarily. Um, but once I started to understand it, it wasn't the gear that was so much important or that exciting anymore. That said, I still, I guess because it's, it's either my my background as a product photographer, or it's just the fact that it, it's the way I approach things, the way I look at things. I I like good design. And so when I see this Panasonic with a beautiful, I haven't held it, but I can just tell you this already. The focus ring isn't too close to the, uh, let's see, if we go back here. With the Fujifilm, the whole thing is a little bit smaller. The, the, the focus ring isn't actually that close to the body. However, it is closer. Um, and a lot of Fujifilm lenses, the zoom, ran, the zoom, let's see if I can get one for an example. No, I can't. The, I can, just one. Here, I'll get it here. I know there's not a good comparison here. I know there's not a good comparison basically because, uh, the lens that we're looking at here, neither one are actually um, our zoom lenses, but this is, you know, they're 16 to 55. One thing I really dislike about this lens is one, the focus ring is so narrow. Two, the focus ring and the zoom ring are composed of different materials. This one having a very thin, easily stretchable focus like band here, elastic band. And this one being, I guess, a piece of aluminium, something like that. That's just, greased it's just it's just on grease it's just like some greased i don't know i don't know what it's on it's not it doesn't feel like bearings it's just like grease it doesn't have a obviously it's flyby wire but there's certain flyby wires where it feels like it's connected to something else this one's just floating here good resistance though but it's the ribs are too close together so that even if you have slightly like if you're sweating or something like that or if you've got lotion on or it's cold it's easy to miss grab this it doesn't have resistance or um, friction there's no friction there and with the zoom ring the zoom ring is too close to it and the zoom ring is also if you look at it fatter than the focus ring the focus ring should be as fat as <laughs> the focus ring should be fat it should be as fat or it should flare out a, a bit and a lot of fujifilm lenses for some reason they they look like a, like an American football or a rugby ball where it's like fat right in the middle and then it's skinny in the front and the, and the back. And it's just, it just doesn't feel good in the hands. And I think, you know, people talk about, you know, listen, yes, I always bag on Fujifilm and I've been using them for seven years, but I still bag on them because it, their design is bad. There are certain things they do cool and they look cool, but that the design is just, it's the language doesn't, it doesn't translate from this to this to this. It doesn't that doesn't connect in some like good manner. But these Panasonic ones, man, where where are we by the way? Look at that thing. Look at look at that thing. Flares out beautifully where the widest part essentially okay is you know where you snap on the hood, but then below that is the focus ring. You can't miss it, and it's far enough away so that. The, re the palm of your hand is going to rest against the body and your fingers aren't going to be cocked too close to the camera. It It's just beautiful. And the, the photography for it is very good as well. Uh, not quite as good as Nikon's, but yeah, it's, it's just good stuff. So uh, uh, yeah, good design. Like half of the reason I'm probably just always talking about cameras is because the, the, the design, like I, I like, Listen, I'm not into the the consumer aspect of this thing. Is is uh, 
it's actually something I feel bad about. And it's why I'm, I want to get out of, but I, I like doing it, but I want to get out of the sort of, like I told you about the uh, advertising photography. No one needs the stuff that I shoot, but I, I like to see where we are. I, I like to touch things and see how, how this thing interacts with the body. And, and if the design language is matching the sort of the haptic interface and, and, and where, where there's breaks and, and, and what important breaks there are or not. And anyway, I love that sort of thing. Uh, so it's always on my mind. And yes, I'm also male and we're just more gear oriented, I guess, whatever. But like, yeah, so half of this thing, while I do love the photography um, and I'm trying to understand a little bit more in the manner that my wife just understands really well, uh, despite that, the gear is just... It, it's there, and you know the consumer thing is is a is basically a sin, but it it's there, you know. Anyway, I got a um, Victor here says thank you for the great showcase of your wife's photo work. Thank you very much, Victor. It's always nice to have, you know, uh, the two or three regulars that we have here, um, and if anyone else comes in. But thank you very much for that feedback. Um, if you have Victor, by the way, out of all those, um, I don't know if you have a favorite photograph, anyone that stuck out to you. Again, mine. Um, I like her overall, the way she takes the nature, but I really like uh, that one where it's it's the, what is it called? The salon is just, just blows me away every time, it, even now, every time I say, and I see it every day because I go downstairs in our living room, um, print out. Anyway, and we have Virtus. I studied photography from 2000 to 2005, so I still enjoyed last year, the last years of analog before the world turning full digital. That's why I don't suffer from gas. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably that's probably pretty fair. Um, although I would still imagine that some people from that era are still really into, you know, I mean, the gas is. Again, I think personally, I think it's hardwired. I'm I'm a kind of a traditionally minded person, so I think that there's innate things tied to our sex, our like nationality, all sorts of things. So I think there's you know. Um, I think that males are just going to be into that a little bit more. But uh, yeah, I wonder, I'm 40. I don't know if you're older or younger than me. Um, I didn't study photography. I studied post-colonial literature. <laughs> That's why I do photography for a living. Um, and uh, so I, I, I got onto it just almost like uh, it was almost accidental. I got the camera. Then I was asked to do some jobs, and I was like, "Hey, I can, I can make money doing this." So, yeah. Um, and originally, when I got the D two hundred, like I said, I thought I was going to use it the rest of my life, and then I ended up banging it up, and then getting a D eight hundred to replace it. And then I did go into a slip of gas here and there because um, I changed to an A seven R because it made work faster. Uh, work didn't turn out quite as well. The D eight hundred had much better image quality than A seven R, but it made it wouldn't make a real big difference in print or even on websites, maybe no difference at all. But for me, the photography, it was like, Egh. however, with A7R, work was fast, just completely faster. Um, and then I, you know, eventually when I was starting to make uh, quite decent money, I upgraded to medium format and, uh, you know, it all paid for itself. So that was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, um, gas is definitely something I got to worry about. Something my wife says the same thing in a different context, but yeah so now i'm just you know what? we're just going to finish the coffee all right um and we're going to go down to uh let's just see here go back to mirrorless rumors as we finish this <laughs> gas speaking of gas we did the dji panasonic oh, that thing looks amazing it's a beautiful design um oh canon oh this is cool okay so after because i touched the r6 and the r5 I imagine that let's say let's say things go back to normal or whatever, um, and my event photography business goes back to normal, etc., and my family photography business picks up. I will probably eventually get a backup camera that's not a DSLR, and that would probably be something like an R R six, which is so sweet because look at this baby, two hundred bucks for the new 50 1.8 STM lens. One problem, one problem I see here is there's no focus ring on it. That is actually one of those new multi 
input ring ring ling, <laughs> ring ring things. It can be aperture, it can be other things. Um, so it clicks. It's not a smooth focusing thing, which means this isn't going to be a great lens for auto or manual focus. You basically have to rely on the autofocus of your camera. Of course, the autofocus is very good on these cameras, but there's some. I find that when I do manual focus, I'm I allow myself to be a little more creative with things that are in and out of focus, and my mind is more focused on the framing of things rather than the perfection of focus. As well as I also, when I use a manual focus lens or a lens where I can actually focus, I find that I'm a little bit more looser or more cognizant, I should say, of the exposure meter where the meter is pointed and where the lens is pointed. And often I'll point them in two different areas, but when it comes to autofocus, it seems like I'm more, I link them more often than I don't. So, but anyway, it's 199 bucks. I think people are expecting it to be a little bit higher. I think I saw anywhere from 249 to like 349. And some people are like, no, it's gonna be much higher than that. Again, this is just another area where, <laughs> no, it's probably not made out of metal, but it's got a metal mount. It doesn't have a focus ring, but there's 199 bucks and the equivalent to it which actually is not a feel of a perfect field of view and depth of focus equivalent on APS-C uh, in the Fujifilm world is five hundred bucks, more than double the cost. I don't know, man. It's just lenses are cheaper for full frame; they're just cheaper. Now, if you go for the fully highest end stuff that's all available, and Canon seem to be putting a lot of those really high end lenses out for the R system, they're crazy expensive. But when they design a regular lens, and I'm sure this will outperform the 50 or 35 1.5. It'll be a great lens. Eh, they're just, they're cheaper. And it's probably going to be just as small or smaller. I don't know. So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right, let's go down. Sorry, my, <clears throat> my voice is a little bit raspy here. Uh, yeah. Oh, then there, of course, there's a new 70 to 200 f4 great event lens also great for uh high-end family stuff so if you want to do you want to follow your kid at some sporting event great lens for that price is pretty expensive though but that's coming down everyone's lenses are crazy expensive in this in this range anyway so and that would be roughly the equivalent of the fujifilm 50 to 140 f2.8 um, for both full uh field of view as well as depth of focus and you know what? I that lens one big disappointment I have for that lens is that usually the 70 to 200 also doubles as a really good sort of blow out the background sort of uh, bokeh portrait lens. And for Fujifilms, there the way it renders bokeh is I don't want to say harsh, but vertical lines have very hard lines to both the left and the right, whereas with a, a lens that would blur them out more, it would have a center, but it wouldn't have hard line, lines on the left and the right. I think that's a real problem with uh, the X series. There's, If you want to get good go bokeh, get one of the primes, but you can't use any of the zooms. They're just not good. They're sharp. Um, good color, good contrast, but that's it. Let's see here. Pardon me. Had, had gyoza. Anyway, so that's uh, that's uh, I don't know. It's expensive, but it's not out of line with basically everything else that's coming out. You know, Fuji, it's going to be smaller than the Fujifilm uh, f two point eight fifty to one forty. By the way, I just sold mine tonight. Um, let's see here. Oh yeah, the new lenses on the S five. I don't know S five. By the way, pretty compact, but it's still. It's not too compact, and the buttons are not in a weird way. Uh, they're not arranged in a strange way. Panasonic, they just nail design. It's just the camera works. The camera just works. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, okay, here's another. Sigma would make wild loop shooters happy with this new 300 to f2.8 lens for mirrorless system cameras. Of course, not going to come to the Canon R. Maybe it will someday in the future. Probably going to be pretty cool. Sigma's a little bit cheaper than some of the other makers, but it's still going to be some thousands of bucks. And uh, now with, I mean, Sony's autofocus is going to be amazing for wildlife as well as sports. So, yeah, pretty cool stuff. Um, anything else? No, I'm good. I'm good. 
If any of you guys got something to say, oh, here we are, Virtus. Vir Viriatus, I got it here. What's your opinion on the range of Zeiss lenses for Zoni E-mount? Uh, okay, let's see here. I'm trying to remember. I I'm not really big on the Zeiss, but I remember they came out with a 35 2.8, 55 1.8. 24 to 70 at four. I don't remember a lot outside of that. Um, but I, you know, I remember everyone bagging on the 24 to 70. Um, and in hindsight, it seems like it's a decent lens. Uh, just people expected more from Zeiss. I think, what, what is it? It's either distortion or, or, or vignetting or something like that. But whatever the case is, those, those primes from the Zeiss, of course, Zeiss primes are always amazing. Um, so my favorite, uh, I've got a whole bunch of favorite Zeiss lenses. Of course, I did uh, the video that a lot of people disagreed with, the 51.4 planner for DSLRs is my one of my favorite 50s. I wish it had autofocus, but it doesn't. Um, beautiful colors, not too contrasty, not, it's super duper sharp at F2. It's a little bit glowy at F4 or F1.4, but it's, it's good lens, man. Really good lens. And the 51.5, um, I have not a lot of experience with it, but I've seen a lot of photographs that people have taken. It's very, very good. Um, lenses from the same factory, of course, the Feuchtlander stuff, incredible. Uh, my favorite 58 millimeter lens, the Feuchtlander. Uh, what else? I have the Zeiss 102, which was my main product photography lens before I got into tilt shift stuff and then Bellows. Uh, still have that. It's a very, very good lens um, for half macro as well as portraiture. Very, very good bouquet from that thing. Very good color. Um, for macro, it's sharp, but it's not crazy sharp. For portraiture, you'll probably want to stop stuff or uh, blur stuff a bit. It's good, man. That, um, but of course, that's for DSLR, so I'm totally off topic. Basically, Zeiss primes are amazing. They're always amazing. Colors are great. The sharpness is... I, I think Zeiss also designed... One thing I like about Zeiss uh, prime lenses, they designed lenses with a purpose that's not just best sharpness, best contrast, best this, best that. It's They have a lot of lenses um, historically as well as even now that are still in production that... Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Uh, that render in a specific way that's you can say Zeiss like but also just for that lens are like we're gonna make it like this and uh I, I love Zeiss primes I've never used wait a second have I used a Zeiss zoom like actually used it you know I don't think I've ever used a Zeiss zoom so I don't really I can't talk about I can just talk about what people have talked about about those ones um and they weren't talk they weren't happy about the 24 to 70 so whatever but uh yeah zeiss primes are, are the bee's knees and also for the the e-mount those zeiss lenses and even sony's like regular 28 to 70 like the 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 variable variable aperture aperture ring or aperture lens that one the focus ring is in the right place is out like the lens isn't shaped like a football or a or a, a rugby ball it's shaped like that or or straight i can't remember exactly but it's and the focus ring feels decent for a flyby wire lens and the zeiss ones do too there maybe they they rotate just a little bit too fast maybe but they're not loose they feel good yeah i have i really really like the zeiss primes absolutely um and uh, Sony's fly-by-wire system in general is a big step up, maybe two steps up from Fujifilm's. Uh, I, I'm, it's one one big thing I wish Fujifilm would fix on their lenses, all of their lenses, even their new ones that are, you know, much better than their earlier ones. So I'm almost done with my coffee. So any more questions? Got three people watching here. It's probably like someone's coming out. There's a random streamer coming out. He's like, Looks at the time preference title. He's thinking we're talking about something else. So I'm talking about photography, not not what you're thinking. We're going to talk about. Oh, here's another lens, by the way, Fujifilm. Um, interesting design choice. So this is. Uh, can you see? It? You know what we're going to take down. Let's see here. Remove that. All right. So this is an 18 to 55. It's the f 2.8 to four 
tiny lens, decently sharp, very quiet autofocus, um, all metal, has an aperture ring, of course. Uh, variable aperture. Um, yeah, it's just, and by the way, the metal on the mount is beautiful. It's a matte finish instead of shiny. So it it looks, it looks scrumptious, man. This lens looks, is my, does my other one have that sort of matte? No, it's shiny. It's a little more shiny. It's not perfectly shiny, but it's it's a little. Let's put them next to each other. The eight, the sixteen to fifty five. I just didn't settle down. I don't know if you can really see it, um, but this small one has a, a matte finish versus the large one. The large one's a better lens for sure. It doesn't have opto, optical stabilization or anything, but it's it's a better lens. But um, the, the small one has some advantages in terms of because it's straight up, it's easier to grab the focus ring if you ever want to use it over the, uh, what is this called, over the, the zoom ring. I, I much prefer that absolutely over the 16 to 55, absolutely. Um, the aperture ring also, by the way, is, but the, sorry, the aperture ring is a little bit, it's not clicky enough. It moves a little bit too easily. I wish I had labels. I know it's a various aperture lens, lens, so you wouldn't, you know, you why would you have labels when it changes? But um, anyway, it's it's a this was a decent design when Fujifilm came out with this lens. Uh, um, I very rarely use this lens. I was like, wow, that's. I think everyone looked at it. I was like, wow, it's tiny. It is just tiny, and it's price is not cheap, but it, it performs well. Focus is quiet and smooth for Fujifilm. It, it, there was, for me, it portended a lot of good to come. And in general, you know, I've, um, I'm, you know, Fujifilm people are going to be upset at me, you know, but they don't, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm leaving the Fujifilm world. Some people say you'll come back, but I, 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 um, I don't know. I'm just, I don't like the design language of these two come of Fujifilm. It just doesn't, just doesn't work. Um, overall, so uh, I kind of wish that the the sort of trajectory that they started on, which at least very early on, although they made some misses here and there, like the feel of the 35 1.4 wasn't very good. The aperture ring didn't feel good. The, the focus ring didn't feel good. The way the lenses were shaped were just a little bit easier to work with than the lighter lenses. Anyway, final question. What about those cheapo Chinese lenses from Samyang? Korean lens, by the way. I got an 18 f 2.8 for my A7. Honestly, it's not that bad. Sam Yang, um, now you've been in photography longer than I have. When I was in Korea, I think they were just starting to get uh, popular, or people were just people in the West at least were just starting to understand that Sam Yang was a company, and uh, they were getting interested in it. They, of course, had done binoculars or security systems in Korea for a long time, and uh, their lenses back then. <laughs> Cheaply made plastic, etc. Very good prices, but also apart from distortion, very good lenses. And uh, from what I understand, and I've used at shows, I've tried them on. They seem to be very good. In fact, there it could be that their their optics in terms of sharpness and that sort of thing, maybe not character, are, are basically as good uh, as anyone's. Um, and I think that they're getting better overall now. They have autofocus, and it seems like their autofocus motors are good. And I believe they're made also made in Korea, which is um, a big benefit. Now you might be able to you might be able to tell me if your lens is made in Korea or made in China, but I think it's it's a massive benefit um, that it's actually made in. If it is made in Korea by Koreans, designed in Korea, it's got a horrible logo. It's Korean, modern Korean, but uh, yeah, they're good. Those lenses are very good, and they're getting better all the time. And uh, one of the benefits probably of mirrorless is that more of these third-party makers are going to be able to either either sort of make those lenses that work on mirrorless via adapter or make uh, adapt lenses that work not as a first party but as a third party alternative on different mounts um, very easily and the the, the access to, to lenses is very nice so yeah they're Korean yeah Sam Young are Korean yeah yeah, they actually very they sound very much like Sam Yang or Korean Sam. So Samsung, of course, you know uh, they used to be the largest company in the world back when we lived in Korea. They were they were much larger than Apple. Um, 
by the way, you probably don't know Sam Young, uh, Samsung. They make the, I think, out of the top tallest buildings in the world, I think they make three of the top tallest buildings in the world, including the first tallest. Uh, they have the largest shippery in the world, the largest construction company in the world. Uh, I think right now they're the largest electronics manufacturer as well. They used to make cars. They actually made cars in the 90s. Um, they don't make them anymore directly. They do import cars, Renault, 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 Renault and Nissan. They import and they put the Samsung logo on them. But it's a... Um, <laughs> they're not cheating that's actually some sort of agreement um so yeah i just checked them out and the lens that says made in korea awesome man yeah that's really cool that it's made in korea uh one thing off topic but not really when we live in korea one thing i really was uh impressed about and it's going to change of, of of course over time as all things do under a international capitalist system things were still made in korea when i first came to japan in 1999 there was a lot of stuff still made in Japan, but it was getting pushed out to China. And now there's, I'm always surprised when I see something made in Japan, even if it's a more expensive thing. It's like, oh, well, it, they actually took the time and probably employed their own people to make this as well as design it and everything. And I, I feel very good about that. But in Korea, you can have very cheap uh, digital audio players. You can have cheap lenses. You can have a lot of cheap and high-end stuff and a lot of it still is made in korea and it's just it's a good feeling um yeah so samyang made in korea sweet and they're a korean company from i believe they were um like a security camera company yeah so that was like your last question but then you followed it like you're, oh are they korean didn't know that and then uh then you then you commented so yeah i suppose that's enough uh, if anyone, you know, if there's someone else just waiting, I've got like three sips of this thing left. Um, but otherwise, yeah, basically, yeah. My wife shoots in the moment and her photographs, I think, um, of high time preference photography are some of the best I've ever seen, um, for the way she does it. And she, she's not a photographer. She doesn't call herself a photographer, but she has some of the best people photographs I've seen that would compete easily with professionals and on the street i think that she has some of the most iconic photographs i've ever seen uh by not only a non-professional but i would put i would put up that barber one i would put that up i would put that up in a contest yeah for sure i haven't it's not mine she took it but i was there i was there wasn't her coach or anything like that in fact over the years i've um probably my photography in terms of how I interact with people and plants and stuff like that, it's probably changed a little bit to be more like hers um, than the other way around. So we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, thank you very much, Virat, v <laughs> Viratis, and of course, Victor. And we had one other guy here for a little while, didn't we? Corling. Corling. Don't know who you are. If you came here before, sorry for mistaking that, but I'm glad to. Glad that you were here for a little while. Thank you very much. Uh, guys, have a really good week. I'm going to try to do this on Thursdays about this time. So look for, if you follow me, if you're one of the very few people that follow me on Twitter, uh, look for Fotaku Lounges if I don't get canceled again, not canceled, uh, deauthorized or whatever. Look for my messages on there. I do have, what is that thing called? Disc, not discuss. That one that like people use and they like server. What is it called? Just one. It's called uh, Discord. I have a Discord. Never used it. Try to set it up. It's possible we get some chat in there. Be easier, uh, as well as maybe to to organize some live streams. But I want to try to do this on Thursdays about this time. I'm gonna try to organize. I have a couple of guests in the wings, but getting them organized. One guy's just busy. My Nick and Sensei. And then another guy is in England, um, the ones that I want to have first, and it's hard to organize with them. So maybe, but anyway, I, I want to try to get some guests on and have sort of conversations um, and get some different input. Again, I don't want to focus on the gas side of it. My interest story is is more on the, listen, I, I care about the design 
language and the th themes of the design, how it meets the product, as well as sort of the output. And uh, I want to bring on guests who are also interested in the same thing and to have a slightly different talk about either photography or audio, as well as I want to do it, an actual talk about movies with some people who think either from a different perspective than me or the same um, about movies that were kind of impactful. But anyway, that's good. So thank you very much, guys. Have a great one. I will now kick this bad boy back to the uh, the the out outro screen, and I'll see you. I'll see, wait. How do you? No, no, stop it, man. The 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 way I get out here is always it's always kind of tough here. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Have a uh, have a great time. <sighs> Oh, no, 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 no. Volume down, volume down, volume down. Ah, man, I, screwed, I always screw this part up. Just go back, back like that. Okay, there you are. And just record lower, like that. There you are. Okay, and then I'm still on the screen.